Well, hi everyone, it's Paul Tilly, and welcome to class three of the TB1020 module. And uh, this module is about business planning. So this particular module is really th a three-part one. So we'll look at it over the next couple of weeks. The idea of the business plan. So the very first thing we need to talk about is what exactly is a business plan. So we'll look at that first. So a business plan is really a tool. It's nothing more than a uh, I'll call it a written walkthrough that you go through in order to really think about your business so that you can mentally walk through it before you spend any money. It's hard to do. Not a lot of people like to write business plans. Not a lot of people like to sit down at a desk. You know, people tend to be, if you're an entrepreneur, you want to be doing it as opposed to thinking about it. What happens is, surprisingly, a large number of businesses fail. And you're going to invest a lot of money in something, and you want to make sure that the probability of success is that much greater because you don't want to lose your money. So the business plan is a, is a proven tool that helps you reduce the risk of starting a business and enhances the chances of your business's success. Now, it's a lot of work, as I say, to do a business plan. So one of the things you're probably going to want to do first is what we're going to talk about tonight, and that is assessing the feasibility of the business idea. And what that is really is a micro business plan. So instead of a full blown micro, instead of a whole blown plan, what the feasibility study does is it attempts to go through a first cut of a business plan and it provides that bit of background research that you can use in order to build your business plan. Now, the business plan serves two basic purposes. It's a document for you, for planning, but it's also a document for selling. You need to be able to go after investors and go after potential suppliers, go after potential people who are interested in supporting you in your business. So the business plan helps you do that. It demonstrates to them, this is what the business is all about, and this is what it's going to do. It effectively plays a critical role in moving the whole thing forward. If you need to make your business idea, a business reality, a business plan is a useful tool for doing that. Now, a typical business plan, in terms of what we think about as a written document, like something that you would have on paper, is usually in the 25 to 30 pages in length. It gives the reader a clear description of what you're trying to do here. Here's my business idea. And it connects that business idea with the skills that you bring to it. So you want to make that connection to say you're the proper one in order to move this forward. As I say, doing all these things takes a lot of time and energy. If you're starting a business, the business plan is useful, obviously, because it helps get it started, but it's not only limited to starting a business. If we're talking about starting a business, you know, it turns the idea into reality by getting people on board to help you. It helps you secure financing and it certainly lays out what are the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats that you're looking at. But it's not just limited to that. You could write a business plan for a business that already exists. You know, you need to take your business ahead further. You need to make it grow. You need to create a new investment opportunity for people to put money into your firm so that you can make a bigger building or buy extra equipment. So the business plan can be useful for that purpose, too. It clearly communicates the vision to potential investors. It develops a, a plan in terms of a forecast for if we spend this money, here's how long it's going to take for us to get that investment back. And it actually allows us to create a measuring stick so we can measure how well we're doing versus how well we plan to do. You can also think about a business plan in terms of growing the business, in terms of helping raise capital, creating a strategy for the growth, a plan, basically, and taking advantage of opportunities as they come up. And there's lots of opportunities. If you're an existing business, too, you know, you can think about how you can get out of your business. You might want to think about it in a weird way. You're ready to retire. How do you sell that business to someone? Well, business plan is also helpful for that environment where you say, okay, I've done my business now for 30 years. I need someone to come in and buy it from me. Here's the basic sales pitch that uh, that person is going to use in order to value the business and pay you some money for it. 
As I say, that business plan, regardless of what level you are in the business planning stage, new business, growing business, removing yourself from the business, in order to really get a good sense, particularly when you're starting business, uh, you want to be able to have a good idea of what you're going to be doing, a good idea of what you're going to need to do. You're going to have to get a good idea of how much money is going to have to cost, you know, how much costing you're going to look at, what you're going to have to buy. Basically, you're going to have to do some research first. Now, as I say, most businesses don't succeed, as is the truth, too, with most business ideas. Most business ideas won't go past the paper that they're written on. So how do you get around this problem of a business plan takes a lot of work, yet I need to have some sort of planning in order to make it successful? Well, the first thing you really want to do is do what I like to call a pre-business plan. It's the basic research, effectively, that you're going to need to incorporate into a business plan, but it's not a full-blown business plan. It doesn't have the depth, it doesn't have the detail, and certainly doesn't have the length. This is what we call the feasibility analysis, and this is what we want to talk about tonight. You have this wacky business idea. You have to prove to yourself that it's not so wacky. You're also going to have to prove to someone else that it's not so wacky. So how do you do that? Well, fundamentally, what it comes down to is, can the business make money? You need to be able to prove that this business idea can make money. There's a market for it. That market will generate enough dollars so that will, it will pay for your investment. So the feasibility analysis is essentially that. It is that first cut that says, yeah, this idea has some potential. Okay. If we look at the rationale for feasibility, you know, look, one to 2% of business ideas ever prove viable. So you, you know, if you're going to do a full fledged business plan on something that there's a 99 or 98% chance it's not going to come to fruition, you'd have to do a lot of business plans and that takes a lot of time. So feasibility analysis is your first cut that kind of thins down all of your business ideas to find the one that is probably the most uh, potential for success. So the business feasibility study really is a tool that you use to determine if a business idea is potentially viable. And uh, it, it really takes the stuff that we talked about last week, the strategic planning, and incorporates it into it in order to, to, to create that, yeah, I think this is going to work idea. So the feasibility study needs to answer one basic question. Does the business idea make sense? Can it pay itself back? And does the analysis, it, it does that basic analysis of the business opportunity in a number of ways. It looks at money factors. It looks at technical factors. It looks at location factors. It looks at all of these basic things you're going to want to look at whenever you want to put a business somewhere and try to make it work. So it's very much, as I say here, a deliberation phase. It's that first cut that says to you, yeah, I should take this further. No, I shouldn't. And it you know, saves you a lot of time if you're doing a feasibility analysis, as I say, as opposed to a full-fledged business plan. What do we normally do in this feasibility analysis? Well, if you look online, you will see that there are lots of suggestions for this. I just kind of boil it down into three broad, broad categories that really kind of fill the, what, what you're trying to, to answer, that fill the gap there in terms of what this feasibility analysis is supposed to do. First of all, it's gonna calculate or give you an idea of the market feasibility. This really goes down to, is there a big enough market for this product that I wanna sell? Are there buyers? That's market feasibility. We also need to think about the technical issues in terms of the site and the equipment that you plan to buy and these sorts of things. What would you need in order to make this work? You know, and you got to think about, okay, I'm going to open a machine shop, for example. Here are some of the things I'm going to need a lathe, I'm going to need a drill press, I'm going to need, and you're going to, that going to need list is going to stretch quite long. In fact, the feasibility analysis gets you thinking about exactly what you're going to need. Everything from the lathe, to the drills, to the drill bits, to the parts inventory, how you're going to manage that. That's all part of the technical analysis, the nuts and bolts of it. Pardon the pun. 
We also think about the site that you're setting up at. You know, does the site facilitate the success of the business? If you build a site in the middle of nowhere and you require people to walk through the door in order to buy your products, that's not such a good idea. So we need to ask, does the site that we're choosing fit the business? Not all businesses will fit in every single site. High traffic, if you got people walking in, you don't need high traffic though if people think about this and plan their purchasing. You know, if, if it's especially a product, people will come to you. Whereas if it's a generic product, you need people to, to, to see you and you need to come to them or you need to be, place yourself in their, in their foot traffic. The third element always comes down to money, financial. Can this make money? And it has to, and it's not only to make a profit, okay? Your business idea might make a profit. That's true. But let's think about what a profit is. A profit means that you made more money than you spent. So you ask, I would ask you then, is a $1 profit adequate for you? No. $2 profit? No. $10 profit? $10,000 profit? Million dollar profit? What's, what's useful to you? And you say, well, okay, what do you mean by that? Well, well, let's think about it. Let's assume you have a job now that's paying you $100,000 a year. You're going to start up a business that's going to give you a profit, let's say, of $20,000 a year. Are you satisfied with that? Would that maintain your lifestyle? Would that be adequate for you? Is, is that, you know, is, are you willing to put your, your dream ahead of your financial commitments? So these things you need to start thinking about and the feasibility analysis is really going to start answering some of those basic questions for the business idea and be able to make you say at the end of the feasibility analysis, yeah, this should go further. This has a lot of potential or no, this is a dud. Let's just stop it here right now. So what are some of the key questions? Well, these key questions I've illustrated here cover all three of those categories that I just noted. You know, how big is the potential market? Is the market growing? Is this something that's getting bigger? What's the competitive situation? Uh, are there lots of companies out there the same as mine? Are there very few? Is there a lot of competition? A little bit of competition? Um, is the site adequate? Does this site match what I'm selling? Uh, do we have the necessary resources and time? You know, if it's a $10 million enterprise, that you're thinking about and you only have $2 million, where's the other $8 million coming from? Um, now, if, the, if you can prove a business can make money, you can get any amount of money whatsoever because as long as it makes money to pay those people back that you're borrowing money for, you know, the business is feasible from the perspective, does it generate enough dollars to pay them back? If it does, it doesn't matter how much money the business costs at least it will generate enough money to pay those people back. <coughs> Excuse me. We've got to think about pricing structure. And the reason that we need to worry about pricing structure is that's going to dictate our revenue when we combine that with our quantity. How much do we plan to sell? How much are we selling it for? That will give us our potential revenue. Um, our projected sales, that's going to play into our revenue in terms of how much we plan to sell. Um, revenue projections, like is, is revenue going to continue to go up? Is it slow at the start and going to speed up or is it going to drop off? You know, what's happening with revenue over the longer term? Startup costs, you know, as I say, you're planning your machine shop. You went through your list of things you need and you say, well, how much does that cost? And it adds up to two and a half million dollars. You know, there's the startup money you're going to need. And it will tell you how much money you need to borrow or how much money you need to get investors to come in on. Um, the daily, monthly, weekly sales, you know, depending on the type of business that you have, you might want to be able to figure out how much do I plan to make? This is as much for cash flow. When does the money come in? When are my bills due? Do this match up? Or will I need a good line of credit or financing in order to get me over humps? The other thing that we talked about uh, before in the marketing chapter was the concept of break even. Do we make enough money? To cover our costs in terms of the selling costs, but also to cover our fixed costs, which are the 
what we did, what we invested into the business in our start at two and a half million dollars or whatever, do we need enough to cover that? And if we sell enough product, we should be able to what we call break even. But what is that magic point? How much do we really need to sell in order to break even? And uh, ultimately, it comes down to the basic question, is the business profitable? Can it make enough money to pay for itself? I have in the in the course, you know, the idea, if you look in the, the D2L uh, documents, you'll see some of these basic questions laid out in a template like this. And this template, we can put a weight on. You'll notice here I have a, a weight section. How important is that? So we can weight it. So you can say this is worth, oh, I don't know, 20% of the decision is based on that question or 2% of the decision is based on it. And that way you can kind of get a, a better sense of how important that issue is relative to the total. So let's just do run through a quick example. You know, the business idea, for example, to start a machine shop in Clarenville. I'll just pick Clarenville because that's where I am. Um, so this is a manual machine shop. We're not doing the CNC stuff. So it's just manual. And we ask, first of all, well, what's the nature of the industry? Is there a big industry here? Do we need people doing machining? Is there a call for it? Do we have an industry next door? Do we have a combat chance refinery or do we have an oil industry? These sorts of things. And if we do, that's good because we really need that for our business. And then we ask ourselves, how's that industry run? Is it cyclical? Meaning that some years are good, some years are really good, some years are bad, some years, you know, so we got to think, is the industry steady in terms of a steady bit of business or does it go up and down? Is it a residential business? We got lots of customers coming through doors, residential. We're not making a lot of money on each one. So we gotta be, we gotta have all that, all our systems geared up for lots of people coming through the door. How do we manage that? What kind of facility do we have? Or is it a commercial business? We don't have a lot of people coming through the door. We're selling large volumes of things to a commercial customer. Different type of business, right? So the the, the physical plant or the facility you have wouldn't be needing really a, a viewing area or these sorts of things that you would probably need in a residential you wouldn't need in a commercial and are there lots of firms out there doing the same thing are you the only in town or are you one of several what's the key features in the industry we want to think about that you know what what is the scope how big is it how how many dollars of sales is done each year how much of the pie, how big is the pie and how much of the pie do you plan to get? What's the possible target markets? You know, if you're thinking about uh, machining, for example, you could say, well, the oil industry is really my target market. So I sense that they're growing, that has a lot of demand, or maybe it's a pulp and paper business, maybe corner book pulp and paper, or, or maybe it's the new hydrogen opportunity or the new windmills. You know, you got to think about what is the target market that we're going to sell them to? Or is it cabin owners or these sorts of things or small farmers? You know, who are we selling to? Who would be the bulk of our customers? And as I mentioned before, this concept of the Pareto principle that 80% of your sales come from 20% of your customers. You want to pick the top 20% of your customers as your target market. Is it a new industry or a mature industry? The oil and gas industry I would consider is a mature industry. It's been around a long time. People know the ins and outs of it. The hydrogen industry or the windmill industry, brand new business. Not a lot of people know about it here. So, you know, you got to trade carefully. The good thing is, though, there's fewer competitors. What's the basic demographic characteristics of the target market? This is particularly true for residential customers. If you're selling something, for example, seniors housing, if you're producing seniors housing uh, and you got a lot of seniors, the demographic matches, the, mar the market demographic matches what you're selling. However, if you're selling stuff for kids and it's all seniors, it doesn't necessarily match. So you want to think about if, if you're selling particular residential, you know, demographic is age, gender, how much money people have, these sorts of things that you want to consider from your customers do your business match that? How large is the target market? Uh, if you if you say, okay, well, I got a couple of target markets. I want the oil and gas industry, plus I want residential customers. How big is that market? 
how how you know is there enough potential money to be generated from those markets really to sustain you or to allow you to succeed? Uh, where are those target markets located? If most of your business is in St. John's and you're setting up shop in Clarenville, is that a good idea? Does that work for you? You know, um, if most of your business is around Clarenville and you set up in Clarenville, that probably works much better. Which markets are expecting to grow? So you look at your target market and say, oh, all in gas industry, you know, is, is that industry really dying? You know, the environmentalists will tell us that industry is a dying market. Maybe it is, but, you know, the demand for oil, if you look objectively, the demand for oil is going to continue over the next few years. So to say it's a dying industry right now, probably not. Certainly in another 30 years, but how far do you want your horizon, your planning horizon to go? Probably no more than five years. Who are the key competitors? we got to know who our competitors are, what skills they have, as I say, to be able to assess their strengths, weaknesses, opportunities. Uh, what is it that they are facing out there? And what is it you'd face in facing them out there? How large are these competitors? Do they have deep pockets? Are they very large? Are you like David and Goliath here? Is this a reasonable venture for you to look at? The pricing. Um, you look at the competitors and you say, well, they're pricing at this level. In other words, they're doing a job, for example, they're charging, I don't know, $1,000 an hour for the work on average. Uh, if you're thinking about uncut, undercutting that and saying well, $500 an hour, can you sustain that? It's it's nice to say that I can compete on price, but can you, sus can you make money at $500 an hour? If you can't, you won't be in business that long. You might think that's a swell idea. It will just half their price. And also, if they have their prices too, they could put you out of business quick because if you can't make money, they're not making money either, but their pockets might be deeper than yours. Uh, what are the competitor's strengths? We need to be able to assess their strengths relative to ours. What's their weaknesses? Again, we want to look at their weaknesses and look at them relative to ours. How difficult is it to enter the market? Is this a business that requires lots of investment? Now, the great thing, you might think, well, that's not good. You know, I need to come up with a lot of money in order to get into this market. The great thing with the idea of the business being hard to get into or the market hard to get into because it has a high, what we call a barrier to entry. The great thing about that is that if the barrier to entry is high to you, it's high to everyone else too. So you're going to have fewer competitors entering the market. If everybody can do this, any, meaning that anyone can enter the market because it's easy to get into, there's going to be lots of competitors chasing you if they see you making money and everyone else making money. It's going to attract people into the market. So a higher barrier to entry or a high get into the party, the, the cost to get into the party, the higher it is, the less competitors you're going to have. And that could be a benefit. How is a proposed business, business different than your competitors? What are you going to do different? What is it that they don't have that you're going to bring to the game? Can you capitalize on those differences? One thing to say, okay, yeah, that's that's what we're going to do different, but how can you do that? How do you operationalize that? We're going to do it faster. Okay, nice to say that you're going to do the product faster or do the work faster, but how? Do you have some way to do that? Because if the average time would be the same for both of you if you have exactly the same assets or the exact same number of people. So, again, you need to be able to think about how do you capitalize on that? Um Target market share, that is the slice of pie. So the market is that big. How big a slice are you going to get of it? Do you feel that you'll get 20% of the market? If the market is a $10 million market, 20% of it is $2 million a year. Is that enough for you? Can you do it? What are you going to do in order to get it? With regards to site issues, you're going to think about, well, okay, I need to set up shop. Is there a shop available? Can I rent something? Is there land available? Can it be leased? Does it already exist and I'm going to rent it? Or do I have to start from scratch? Again, it's going to have a big impact on your startup costs. What's the basic criteria for the office? You know, as I say, residential, you're going to need a show area. If it's commercial, you probably don't need a show area. Depending on your customers and who you plan to sell to, the setup of your physical shop is going to change. And where it's located. You can't put it out in the woods if you're relying on traffic to come through your business. 
is there's adequate site, site access, not only for your customer, but for your suppliers. Let's say, for example, you're running a machine shop and you're bringing in heavy items. You need a garage door. You need a loading dock. You need those types of things that don't allow that to happen. Uh, what's the best location for a physical plant? It's nice to say that my location is adequate, but is it the best location? Are there others that are better? I got to be able to assure that I assess the best possible location. What's the cost of the site? How much does it cost to make that site ready? If you're leasing it, you're going to have to do some changes to it. If you're buying it, starting from scratch, you're going to have to build a building that meets the and can expand. Other technical issues include what type of equipment needs need to be acquired, what will be the cost of those items, how long it will take to get them, particularly in the environment we live in now. That length of time is going to make a big difference with regards to lead times. It, you might have to wait a year to get a piece of equipment that you need tomorrow. What's the quality requirements? So, you know, the quality of the material that you're buying, like the shop you're using or the raw material you have, are there specific quality requirements? Uh, for certain organizations that you sell to, they might require that you have to meet a certain standard, ISO standards, these sorts of things. Will you meet those standards? Who will be your potential suppliers? Where are you going to get the product for this to? You got to think about that. And we've already looked at a lot of that in our work previous. How much raw material will we require? And in a given time frame, can you get the stuff when you need it, basically? What's the availability and the cost? Again, will you get stuff when you need it? Now, your resources, probably the biggest challenge that any business face. Do you have the people who can do the job? So if you're going to promise to do machine work, for example, do you have machinists? Can you get machinists? What's the quality level of those machinists? That makes a big difference to your business because that really is the heart and soul of your business. And that's going to be what your, you know, your competitive advantage is going to be. Are the people available in your area? If you're setting up a shop in the middle of the woods, can you get people to go there to do the work? challenging mining operations for example when you set up a mine the, where the mineral is located really dictates where it's set up if it's remote was well, bay for example you got to get people to come in there and that comes with all kinds of challenges you got to fly them in you got to accommodate them these sorts of things can the business attract required talent are people willing to go to labrador are people willing to go to some remote location are people willing to go to claremont how are you going to retain people how are you going to, you know, one thing to say, we'll pay them more. Well, okay, that drives up your cost. That's the biggest factor, cost factor in your business is cost you resources. How are you going to do that? Can you do it with the sales arrangements that you have planned in terms of your revenue? The financial feasibility is really going to be predicated on all those things you've done. And the financial feasibility ultimately is the end game. If your business cannot make money, you're dead. The business does not exist. It will never exist because the goal of business is to make money. So all of the things you've done above this now in terms of those initial stages that I just talked about, ultimately, you're going to have to be able to prove at the end of the feasibility analysis that this business has the ability to turn a dollar that is adequate for your purposes. So you need to know your startup costs and you need to be able to project your revenues into the future in order to be able to come up with a number that you can use to say, this is my estimated profit from this business. Now, granted, most businesses don't make a profit for the first couple of years. So you've got to ask yourselves, when is it going to start making a profit? Will that profit be adequate to keep me in the business? These are critical questions that feasibility analysis are intended to, is intended to, to resolve. If, if you check the boxes on all of those in this feasibility analysis and you say, yes, this has a lot of potential to make money, then and only then do you move to a fully fledged business plan. And the great thing is with doing the feasibility analysis is a lot of the groundwork that you need for the business plan is done in the feasibility analysis. You need to flesh it out a little bit more, no doubt, but it's a great basis from which to build the business plan that we will look at in the next 
week and the week following. If you have any questions at any point in time during the week, please let me know and we'll see you next week.